And now, back to David Spada and Elliot Harris for more sports and torts on TalkZone.com. All right, and now for the second portion of the program. No bikinis involved this time. We have former Minnesota Viking and Seattle Seahawks defensive tackle, John Randall, Pro Football Hall of Famer, who submitted to an interview with David Spada and myself. How did you end up at Texas A&M? It was called Texas A&M at Kingsville when I got there, but uh, how I got there was um, my uh, uh, college coach at my junior company at the junior college, his name was Keith Waters, um, was a, he was a defensive coordinator, and basically got, he got there, he was there, and uh, I got there a year later, and uh, he recruited me to junior college. He transferred for a better job at Texas A&I as a linebacker's coach, and um, I just followed him down there. What was Kingsville like? I think, <laughs> you know what, I put in the words of uh, Tom Moore, the former offensive coordinator for the uh, Indianapolis coach. He went down to Texas a and I one time and said, um, if a man had six months to live and he went down to Kingsville, Texas, that would be the longest six months of his life. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot to do down there. And it was nothing to do but just uh, uh, play basketball, lift weights, um, and just watch the cars pass by. It wasn't. It, it's a town of about ten thousand people uh, down in South Texas, but yeah, it wasn't nothing, nothing to do around there. So I see that you tried out for your brother's team, the Buccaneers, but they thought you were too small. Did that basically make you think maybe I should go into something else rather than football? No, you know what? Um, going down there, to, uh, seeing my brother, and going out of uh, camp at the time, seeing my brother, basically just kind of was a um, was a way for me. Kind of uh, it was kind of like a high school moment when I went to high school, and you know I faced the same thing in high school. It was a brother that went to school, went to high school before me, and uh, you know everybody was telling me this is where your brother did this, this is where your brother did that. And it just kind of reassured me that going down there wasn't the right idea for me. But so basically, they did me a favor and told me I was too small to play defensive line. And, uh, you know, it was where I said, but basically, I came down there and I said, I want to play defensive line. And they said, no, you're going to play linebacker like your brother. I'm going, okay, I can see where you guys are putting me in his category, but. I knew in my mind I was a defensive lineman, and uh, you know it just re- reassured to me that my decision, what I wanted to do was, you know, it was something I wanted to do, even though my brother was playing a different position. And so it didn't take long for me to make my mind and uh, to and to leave. Now, had you hoped to be drafted? Had you anticipated uh, somebody would pick you? I, I thought I would. I thought I would be drafted. Uh, you know, Coming out of small school, you don't really know what everything the teams are thinking back in the, you know, and facing in, in the late eighties, and the, you know, you, you don't really, you didn't really know what teams were thinking. But I thought I had a chance. I and uh, you know, I sat around for two days, two days all day, waiting for somebody to call, and they uh, hoping that someone was gonna, you know, was gonna pick me, and. Uh, you know, at some point I felt embarrassed, but, you know, I just said, you know what? You know, it, didn't, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. What was your first contract with the Vikings uh, worth when you were an undrafted free agent? Uh, my first contract was about 50000 and before taxes. They gave me like a uh, $5,000 signing bonus, which is basically $3,000 and, uh, you know, $30,000 after taxes, but... <laughs> The money was it wasn't all about about money. It was just being able to make it. That because I knew in the back of my mind that I I want to give it a try because I said to myself, I don't, if I don't try this, I will, will regret this for the rest of my life. And uh, there were a few things in life that I said that to myself, and this was one of the things I said. You know what? Starting the day, I'm going to change. I'm not going to be that kid who grew up in a town of 150 people and just the backwoods, I'm going to be a guy that all of a sudden says, you know what, I'm going to stand for something and, and I'm going to make um, say that, you know what, 
at least I try it out. How difficult was that transition as an undrafted free agent? You know, you're not coming in with a big contract. You're not coming in with a, a lot of expectation. Oh uh, yeah, that, that was actually that was a huge transition because um, I mean, here I am. I mean, a year ago, I'm watching so many guys on TV. Now, uh, now these guys played on television. These guys played at schools with their names on the back of the jersey. And um, I'm a Division two player coming into this big place. I draft ticket, but they were basically a free agent. And some of these guys went to the same schools. And, and, and I almost felt as if I was going to a new school for the first day. And uh, I just felt completely out of place. But uh, I knew, but only, I knew one place that I kind of felt everybody had a, a, uh, an even shot was on the football field because you know I kind of faced that by going to a junior college, then also going to Texas A and I. That I felt out of place at those two places, but the one place that I felt comfortable with was on the football field because it didn't matter where you came from who you were, but your athletic ability and your talents would, would give you a better chance of playing or it was just it didn't matter where you came from, it was just about who you were on the football field. And then the defensive line with the Vikings was pretty good when you joined them. You had what, Henry Thomas? Yeah, well we got man, I got there you had Keith Millard, the defense tackle, Henry Thomas, nose guard, uh Chris Dolan, the defensive end, you had Al Noga and these guys sit around each other like that they've been knowing each other for like 10 years. So here I am again. And just because, but at least one thing I thought when I looked at coming to Minnesota and I looked at the guy's weight, the, Al Mose was like six six foot tall. Henry Thomas was like 6'2". Dobin was 6'5". And I think... No, Dobin, you know, Keith was like, Keith Miller was like 6'6", but I thought, you know what? I can, and the average weight was about 260, and I said to myself, you know what? I can at least kind of fit in with these guys' weight, but when I got there, when I, after being there and, and seeing these guys, I just knew I had a long way to go. Now, in, in 93, you have 12 and a half sacks. You make the Pro Bowl. At that point, do you say, you know, I, th- I think I'm as good as anybody else playing this game. You know, not I, for what I thought. I saw, I see things differently than most people do. Most people sit around and look at their accolades and said, I accomplished this, I accomplished that. I, I was looking at it as at the end of '93. I was looking forward to '94 because um, at that point it was I was trying to be. I want to prove that. I was the best defensive tackle that was in the league. I wanted to prove that. So every year, I wasn't looking back. I was just looking forward. So I was looking at 94 and saying to myself, what can I improve on from 93 to, 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 to make 94 even better? And that's the way I saw it. And, um, you know, we uh, with John Turling and our defensive line coach, he kind of he, – he and I thought similar about we always got to look forward to getting better because, you know, the, the guys that are in the room in 1993, all those same guys are not going to be there in 94. So that was kind of how I was looking at things. I mean, I think you had more trouble in practice going up against the Randall McDaniels and the Gary Zimmermans than you did going against some of those NFC opponents at that time because your line was better than all theirs. No, you know what? That's, that's probably true because um, in practice, all I did was go against Randall, and then um, double teams were going against Randall and Gary. And uh, it, it really, in practice, I, cause my mindset was if you can't do it in practice, there's no way in hell you can do it in the game. And uh, it was kind of like my mama had taught me this thing that. Um, you know, responsibility starts at home. So my thing was, it starts at home. It starts at home means home field, home practice. Everything starts there. So going against Randall every day, uh, I, I can remember my, back to my uh, first 
first year with Paul Wiggins, my defensive line coach, and I was going against Randall, and Randall was tossing me, and I went maybe one, one out of every two weeks. I went went a a, a, a drill against Randall, and Paul Wiggins came to me and said, "What are you doing? Why are you going against Randall?" And I said, "He makes me better." He goes, "But you're not beating him." So he tells me to go against one of these other guys, and I do. And I just clobber one. I mean, I just take these guys and I'm just tossing to the side, left and right. And he comes, and Paul Wigan comes back over and goes, go back to go back, go back to going against Randy McDaniel. I see what you're doing, and I like it. And so that's how my kind of what I was doing. I was always looking to get better. And I know going against Randall, I didn't win a lot, but I knew if I could do something against against Randall that was very productive, I knew in the game it was surely going to work. Well, you certainly seem to enjoy going up against the uh, Green Bay Packers offensive lineman and getting after a certain quarterback named Brett Favre. Well, it, it was just that, you know, Minnesota, state of Minnesota and the state of Wisconsin, side by side. So, um, you know, and I still live here. And every time I'm doing Packer Week, just a few people with these Green Bay Packers flags on their cars. And that always just pissed me off, just like other players, you know, about how uh, the, the Packer fans were just, it, it just, like, it, to me, it felt like they were almost invading our, our state. So when we played against Green Bay, it just made me just, it was almost that Texas Oklahoma rivalry coming up again. And so for me, it just made it more to go out to Brett Favre. And so when we played the Packers, man, it just, it was bragging rights. It was, uh, you know, it was state of Minnesota versus the state of Wisconsin. So Brett Favre would not have conceded a sack to you if you were going for the NFL record like he did Strahan? Oh, probably not. <laughs> probably, yeah, definitely not. Because um, when I went in the when Earth Heaven played in West Green Bay, I got booed, but I liked it. I liked getting booed by those by those Packers fans because for me that just made it even more special. Because here I am, a kid from Monfort, Texas, of 150 people, and I'm walking in this in this in Lambeau Field, and they're calling my name. I'm going, wow, they know who I am. So uh, it just to me it was like being the uh, the villain in the in the Wisconsin. So. Going against Brett Favre, it was just like uh, like Reggie White and I used to talk about it all the time. Going, I would tell Reggie, he was like, Reggie would tell me, "Quote, take it easy on our quarterback." And I go, Reggie, if you were back there, I would take you down. I go, I'm sorry, Reggie. I go, you are Packers. I'm a Viking. We don't, we're not supposed to get along. I go, that's the way it is. But uh, I always love going against Brett Favre. Because he was a true competitor, he was a guy um, as if kind of like that kid in the neighborhood who was always bigger than everybody, and we you always look forward to going against that guy, trying to take him down because he was that good, he was that talented. You also have a reputation as a player for a little trash talking. After some of those sacks, did you uh, impart some wisdom to Brett Favre? Uh, you know what? The, 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 you know, I didn't really use a lot of it. On quarterback, I use if any quarterback I did use it on, I use it on. Uh, you know what goes back to Trent Dilfer because uh, I got Trent Dilfer kicked out of a game at the Metrodome one year because we kept messing with him, talking trash to him, and he thought we were trying to hurt him. And you know, I put his lunges out, and he was trying to. I, somebody tripped me or something, and all I could do was just try to reach out and grab his shoe, and he thought I was trying to take his leg out. And so he dropped, he dropped down on the ground and starts punching me and they, they kick him out of the game. But most of my, uh, I said my way of thinking was to get in the head of the offensive lineman because uh, it was about just saying little things to a guy to not, to get him unfocused because um, in practice, I knew talking to guys sometimes uh, offensive linemen have a tendency of not listening to everything that's going on, especially when the quarterback is calling out the cadence. So I kind of would go back and uh, um, 
and the media guys store that because every month, I mean, every Monday, uh, the media guys will come out and give you a stack of papers. It could be 200, 300 uh, pieces of paper that talks about stories about the opposing team you're going against. And um, I would sit there and read stories about office linemen. You know, one guy may have, his, his wife may have just got married. He has two kids now. Uh, or one guy just bought a brand new car and he's dedicating this season to uh, being able to pay for a car. One guy is all of a sudden saying, you know what, my dad's going to come to every home game and he's going to be in the end zone or something. So I would take that and touch and put it in my memory. And visually I could remember all this stuff about these guys. And if the game was going on, was going on, I could bring it up at the right moment. And you could tell a guy something, and all of a sudden he would seem like as if he was being total shocked that you knew his wife's name, his kid's name, his dad's name, his name of his car, where he got his car from. And it was just, you know, and all of a sudden you and the Dolphins Lama, he was asking you questions like, how do you know that? And you're just smiling, looking at him. He kept asking me, how do you know that? And all of a sudden, the quarterback is trying to pull off his lineman in the huddle. And off his lineman is shoving the quarterback, coming up, get out of the way. And there, there it goes. And next thing you know, those two guys are fighting or arguing in the huddle. And I was, you know, I'm going, hey, my job is done. I have started it, you know, and it takes care of his own. So I would do things like that. It was it was fun, you know. It was fun to do stuff like that. What would put the players over the edge? You talking about their brothers, sisters, wives, or their mom? No, you know what? It wasn't really talking about so much about a guy's mom, but it was you could say stuff to a guy that because you knew the guy said in the, in the media guy that his wife was going to come to every game and sit at the fifty yard line, and so. You just, uh, the conversation could be about if you're going against a guy and all of a sudden, you know, this guy's playing really, he's playing really physical and you're going, hey, look at here, nice job, really nice job. And I can really tell that you are really have been uh, practicing all week, you know, anticipating me coming out here and playing against you. And I can also see that your wife, Susan, who's over at the 50-yard line, she's really enjoying this. And, but you know what? If I beat you on one play, Susan is going to be disappointed. Now, what do you think Susan is going to think about that? And all of a sudden, he's going, how do you know my wife's name Susan? I said, don't worry about that. <laughs> Tell me about it. And the next thing you know, he's going, how do you know my wife's name Susan? I don't know. Maybe because, you know, she did grow up in, what was that town? Ah. She grew up in Michigan. That's right. She went. She went to University of Michigan. You know what? I spent some time up in University of Michigan, hanging out there. And all of a sudden, they just kind of just. And here's a quarterback trying to get him back in the huddle. He's like, "No, no, no! I want to know how he knows my wife's name, Susan." And now she went to University of Michigan. And I'm like, "I'll tell you later. I'll just tell you later." <laughs> so. So you would have had fun with uh, A.J. McCarron of Alabama with his girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A guy like that? Oh, yeah. Because that's what you look for. You look for that one guy that all of a sudden, like, you'll get a guy. And it doesn't happen maybe every two weeks you get a guy that tells you, you're not going to get in my head. You know, okay, no, nah, I'm not trying to get in your head. I'm not trying to get in you. Know, he's like, you can't talk to me. I'm going to see I go, that guy right there, he know, I'm already in his head. He's going to tell me, you're not going to get in my head. Oh, okay, yeah. Huh. And you can just, something, it could be, you could tell his teammate something about him. And you go, hey, can you tell him his girlfriend's up in the stands? You know, and next thing you know, he's going, why are you telling my teammate that? Oh, that's it. I just had a conversation with your teammate. About your girlfriend. You know, she was hot. She, you know, he even said she was hot. And all of a sudden, they started arguing. And that's all it takes, you know? And what we would do, we would do stuff as a demon lineman. We would come to the line of scrimmage, and all of a sudden, we were going to run a game. 
we would have a game named after, say, the quarterback's girlfriend, you know? And we all of a sudden were like, hey, you know what? We're all going to go over Susan's house tonight. We're going to go see Susan. And he's like, why oh, you keep on like my girl? Oh, dude, we really like Susan, you know? And it would just be little games and stuff. We would run, and it was just kick guys pissed off. He quarterback sometimes, you know, wouldn't want to give up a sack. And he just throw the ball, throw an interception. He's like, I didn't give you a sack. I'm like, no, nope, you didn't. But you did give us an interception. So thank you anyway. So. Who talked more trash, you or Chris Carter? You know what? Uh, God, I think Chris and I are probably pretty much tied. But maybe, you know what? I think Chris did a lot more than I did because Chris, uh, you know, being a defensive lineman, you kind of get exhausted from all the running around and stuff in the receivers. You know, you, you, you're you in a better position to talk trash because, um, you know, it's a, it's a the quarterback throwing you the ball. And for us, it's like, it's hard to get, I think it's hard to get a sack than to see someone throw you a pass. So uh, I think Chris is better than I was. Now you had one career interception. You remember that play? Yep, that was against uh, San Francisco. What happened? Uh, it was an offensive lineman named uh, who caught me because my buddy Eddie McDaniel was, was trying to tell me toss him the ball. He was like, I told you to toss him the ball. And I went, dude, listen, this is my first interception. And you want me to toss the ball to you? I go, no, no. I go, this is, I'm getting me any of these. So I'm not going to toss this, but yeah, I got ran down. And, uh, I, I felt like I was going in slow motion when I, when I caught the ball. I caught the ball, I was like, I felt like I was in quicksand. It was the most unusual thing in the world. I see you pissed off the people eating tasty animals there with your commercial with Chase and the Chicken with the Favre jersey on. Oh, yeah, Peter, yeah, I don't, yeah. That, that's one of the people that, uh, you got to be careful when you, when you mess with Peter. Um, yeah, I pissed him off to my, uh, commercial when we we even wrote them a letter telling them that uh no chickens were harmed in this commercial and that didn't still didn't do any good whose idea was the commercial uh that was nike's nike's idea and it was kind of like that rocky thing you know we went through the rocky stuff and uh we did that in uh out in uh hollywood california and uh the funny thing about doing a commercial was we couldn't get the chickens to move we couldn't it wouldn't run so I spent, I think I spent at least an hour and a half just trying, trying to make them, you know, picking one up, trying to chase one, and all of a sudden have one run. And uh, but yeah, we spent a lot of time trying to get those chickens to run. I mean, uh, it was, it was. I think those chickens were all like uh, just pet chickens or something. I thought it might have been for Chick Fil A. <laughs> Speaking of running, who who was the best uh, running back you went up against? Oh, that was Barry Sanders. Because uh, we all, everybody, and we you play Detroit. So you know, Monday night, or Monday morning, was the day you you went in to watch the film film review. So uh, everybody on Monday uh, would say, "You hope you didn't make Barry's highlight tape," because there were several guys that you would see on the tape. You know, you have a guy completely do a three sixty, trying to keep up with Barry and. Uh, for us, it was like watching him on AstroTurf, man. He was just like, you know, we was like, we playing him in Minneapolis, AstroTurf. We playing him in Detroit, AstroTurf. And, uh, you know, it was not wanting to be on Barry's highlight reel because the guy could all of a sudden be back up in the goal line and all of a sudden take it, run it 25 yards. And I mean, it, it was almost as if Barry was running to, to classical music because – he would see him, man. His shoulder was moved, and it was just, I think he, he just like, uh, uh, it was like being like uh, the guy with the flute and the uh, cobra. It was just like very running style. It was almost like low you to sleep. I talked to Richard Dunn a couple of years ago, and he basically said that Emmett Smith was one of the most overrated running backs because he was running behind such a good line, anyone could have done that with talent. And I tell you what, uh, Emmett had a great line. Emmett, Emmett was no pushover, but uh, his offensive line was was devastating because me, once again, knowing the offensive lineman, he had uh, Larry Allen, who bench pressed 692. 
And I'll never forget that. When I read that and those media guys, I go, they, we were talking about all his linemen, and I go, this dude, Finn's press is 692 pounds. And so we were talking about, um, he had Nate Newton. I go, man, Nate Newton, he's big, but Nate can't bench press 692 pounds. Emmett had an offensive line. He had a he had a squad, and, and Daryl Johnson was no joke either. But I think um, the thing about Barry was if, if Barry had had that offensive lineman, that offensive line, man, he would. I think Barry would be still running running today. Now you were in the same uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame class with Emmett Smith. What well, what was going uh, into the Hall of Fame like for you? Uh, you know, it was. Uh, unbelievable because, you know, growing up in Texas, um, Sunday was a day of um, going to church, then watching football, then imitating football on Sunday. And, um, you know, uh, it was unbelievable. A dream come true for a kid from Texas uh, to be inducted. And because I, I just hit high, it's hard to explain, but. You know, it's I – I can't I'm, – I'm, I don't know. It, um, it's unbelievable because I have found myself around my childhood heroes. And, uh, you know, every year when I go back now, I, I sit up – most of the guys, the older guys sit up up front and, and just – and talk about old times. And I sit there – I find myself sitting out there with uh, Roger Starback Dick Buckus and um, my God and, and Earl Campbell and those guys and it's almost like uh, going back in the time because for me I mean I grew up loving the game appreciate watching the game and uh, it's 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 like it's almost as it's it's like a, uh, when you, when you go, when a person goes back to Disney World and they're walking around and looking at it and they're going, oh my God. To me, being around those guys is, it's, it's almost the same thing because they're all just, you know, you're sitting over there and it's like being on the teacups and all of a sudden they're still there. And, and I was sitting there, uh, this year, up here last year, but, um, Franco Harris, John Madden, and Lynn Swan, and these guys were talking about the Macklin reception. You know, I, I mean, they're sitting there talking about it. And, you know, it's it's like going back in time in the history. And me being a history guy, I am fascinated with history. And uh, to, to go back to Canton and sit around these guys is, I think, is a it's like a childhood dream. Did you need all your buddy Dolman at all that you made the Hall of Fame before he did? You know what? I, did, I didn't tease Dole because I think it's already Dole already knows that because uh, Dole, Dole, was, uh, Dole taught me a lot my rookie year. Uh, he taught me about how to respect the game, how to be uh, a professional. And, uh, you know, he was almost like my big brother on the football field because he just taught me so much and, and just, you know, I have so much respect for those. And, uh, you know, it, I was lucky when I came into the league to be around Chris Goldman, Henry Thomas, Chief Millard, and, and they all know because those guys were, it, it was like business on Sundays, but every other day it was like having fun. And uh, that's what I tried to make it make football to the younger guys who I played with. I tried to teach them and show them that it was the same way, having fun. What was it like leaving Minnesota for Seattle? It was a whole completely different change. It was a it was completely different to where I um had to get used to uh drinking a lot of coffee, <laughs> um uh just being in a, a different world. It was just so different, but you know what? At the same time, I had so much fun out there and uh, met so many people. The organization was was great to be around, um, to where I was welcomed with open arms, and uh, I still talk to a lot of guys out there in Seattle. Um, it was, uh, 
No, that's what my wife learned to cook at out there. And uh, it was just, it was just getting used to the rain. And uh, it was just, it was different. It was so different. But, you know, at the same time, it was my wife and I, uh, we, we got a chance to discover Seattle together. And uh, it was just, it was fun. Wait, well, you were playing for former Packer coach, though, Mike Holgram. You know what? He had so much respect for me when I got there. And, uh, you know, he said that he couldn't believe that Minnesota let me go. And I go, well, you know what? One person is jumping, another man's treasure. And I go, you know, things were changing there. We're, and uh, But it, he he was great because he taught me a lot about, cause, you know, I just got married, and he taught me a lot about being a dad. And uh, it was great to see because I always wondered what he was like from watching him on the other side of the sideline. But going over, I mean, being there with him, I got to see what he was all about. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I was lucky to, to get that. Can't do that. It was what, you and Cortez Kennedy were the defensive tackles? No, Cortez, they just released Cortez. They, they signed a guy named uh, Chad Eaton. And we had Chad Eaton and uh, God, we had uh, Savon Kirkland. They re signed the guy. We just got Matt, Matthew Houseback, the quarterback. So you were pretty loaded. Yeah, we were. We were a loaded team, but we just, I think the, what was the unusual thing was the team was just wasn't really used to winning. And when we started winning, it's really, um, the guys is kind of just not used to that. Your career ends, you're tied with Richard Dent with 137 and a half sacks. Was there a party that says, you know, I'd like to get in there for one more play and one more sack? <laughs> no, you know what? No. Uh, no, because, you know, Richard was a defensive man, and I was a defensive tackle, but, you know, I think uh, the way I treated uh, every game when I played it was after the game when I walked off the field, I always looked back and said, did I give my all? And I did. And uh, at that point when I knew, when I, when I, no, I never looked back and said, if I can give one more play, no. You figure a sack by a defensive tackle should be worth more than a sack by a defensive end? Oh, definitely. Definitely it's supposed to. I mean, when a, when a, when a defensive end gets double teamed, he's getting double teamed by a tight end and the defense, I mean, and the offensive tackle. And when you're a defensive tackle getting double teamed, it's by the center and the guard or it's the guard and tackle. You know, so I don't want to make anybody mad, but it's definitely harder to get a sack inside than it is outside. You mentioned that you're a, basically a history buff and you love the game. We interviewed Deacon Jones, and Deacon Jones basically said he was the best defensive lineman of all time. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know what? I, I, I have to kind of disagree because if Sam had a Deacon, don't get me wrong, Deacon is one of the toughest out there. I mean, he virtually started the head slap, you know, which is – it's a, which is, you know, we all know it's illegal now, but that wasn't Deacon's signature move. You know what Deacon's signature move was? What was it? Those other three great people from around that he played with, you know? I mean, I always, I, it, it's like what you said about uh, Emmett having, I mean, Barry having an image line. Now, if I had some, uh, Another Hall of Fame would have had Chris Doman playing with me my whole career. Man, but, you know. He had Merle wow. Olsen, Rosie Greer. Rosie Greer. And uh, the one guy who uh, hurt his knee, he played for a while. Then he got hurt. Then they got another guy to come in and play. But that those guys were like like giants over, over the offensive line. And, I mean, they were like, what, 6'3", I think, in height or six. Four six five because I read I read this story a while back maybe three four years ago and how how they were just you know just unstoppable and because you just didn't know who you were going to stop it was almost like you know the purple people eaters yeah. you know you got Jim Marshall Alan Page and this guy and you're going okay who are you going to double team and uh, you know but uh, I think Deacon definitely started the trash talking. Uh, but um, you know, I'm, I'm to say one of the to say to say one of the best 
she was mama and I always been kind of partial to Reggie White because I don't know, maybe because I got to see it firsthand. Uh but, you know, I have to put Reggie right there next to Deacon. And Bruce Smith, thinks no he's one... the, Bruce Smith thinks he's the best. Oh, well, Bruce was, you know, I stole a few moves from Bruce, but, uh, and, but Bruce wasn't like as how Reggie was just, and Reggie could line up anywhere. And, uh, you know, Reggie was just unstoppable. I mean, you just to stand next to Reggie and just see how Reggie was just, it was like, we used to call, we used to have a joke. Everybody used to call Reggie Jesus because when he put his hands on you, it was like, he just put the large hands on you. So Reggie was, he was just that destructive. Um, I mean, he was just, I mean, the, the guy literally changed Green Bay when he got there. That's, that's the president. That's, you know what I mean? That's what he did. Is there one play that sticks out in your mind from your career, one tackle you, you might have made? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, God, I got several, but one of the biggest ones was when I went against Kevin Gogan playing against the Raiders, and Gogan was like, what did he do, 6'8", 6'1", and uh, I bull rushed him, and he fell back on his heels and fell to the ground, and uh, and I got a sack over him. And I think that was the you know, first one that read me that Gogan had ever given up. And, uh, you know, I actually got it because I got, it was, I got two, two sacks, one over, uh, over Kevin Gogan and the other one was over um, the other guard from, uh, from the Raiders. So it was, it was back-to-back sacks. You know what I feel bad about is that Herschel Walker started in USFL because if he would have been in the NFL his whole career, I think he would have been a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I think so too. Herschel, I got a chance to play with Herschel my rookie year, and uh, he, the dude was this, we call it freakish potty stuff. I mean, he was doing a bunch of, uh, I don't know, 500 sit ups, push ups. Yeah, I was pretty talented. And, uh, but, you know, yeah, I wanted to, what if he would have uh, played his whole career in, in the NFL? Okay. That wraps up another show. Thank you to John Randall, Pro Football Hall of Famer. Also, Chrissy Clausen and Karen Pellini of Team Fab. Tune in again next week. Hopefully David will be back in studio. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Dave Olson. A reminder, you are listening to Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com. See you next time.